Hello and welcome back to another news video for Final Fantasy XIV with me, Mioni. Today we're looking at, yet again, more news coming out of 6.2 before it's even here. This is actually a translation by M. Killerby on Reddit. A link to this Reddit thread will be in the description of the video. Thank you very much for your hard work of translating this. It is incredibly useful to have people like yourself in the community to make videos like this possible and uh, to really hype up future content for the game. Obviously, 6.2 is on the horizon. A lot of people are speculating that it'll be the 23rd of this exact month. So uh, we're still waiting for that officially to be confirmed as the date. And we've got a live letter coming up towards the end of this week. So we should get lots of information towards that, as well as some in-game previews. But for now, we're basically milking the teat of the mysteries in the universe of uh, basically all of the information we can actually get out of this. Now, Famitsu Magazine, which is an online um, interview sort of newsletter type thingy online, um, it's, a, it's, it's, a, it's a journal, um, actually had an interview with Naoki Yoshida, and it's all about 6.2. This was released this morning, and uh, as you can see, three hours ago, M. Killaby, at the time of my recording, translated this for us, which is amazing. So go support that Reddit thread, give it an updoot, I'm going to do mine right now and uh, help um, make that the top post of Reddit. The story of 6.x apparently will end with a certain event. This will completely change the story and 7.0 will be based on this. Interesting. That makes you think that basically we need to have that 7.0 connection. You know, the next expansion, it's going to have to be something big, right? So, very interesting what we're building up to. At a minute, it seems to be a little bit tepid water in the MSQ. I think most people can agree, but it's definitely heating up towards maybe references of the void and things like that. 6.x will change somewhat from the usual pattern of 1 to 3, wrapping up the old storyline, and 4 to 5, oh, 0.4 to 0.5, setting up the next expansion. He says we can expect to start seeing signs of the direction of 7.0 in 6.5. So we're not really going to see um, much about the um, the setup for 7.0 until 6.5. I guess there'll be inklings, but not solid, this is what this is about. I'm personally hoping for an expansion all about the new world, but of course anywhere in Etheris would be a great selection, even Mericidia and places like that. The word memory in the patch title is linked both to the main story and the pandemonium raids. For example, he says the memories and feelings of the inhabitants of the 13th who have now become monsters, and whether the warrior of light and party will reawaken those memories by stepping into their world. With pandemonium, he mentions memories you want to seal and forget. Very interesting. So there's definitely the reference to sealing away something forgotten inside uh, Pandemonium. So hopefully Abyssos sort of alludes to that. Of course, you know, the second tier of that rating coming out in 6.2. The weakest of the Final Fantasy four themes will appear first. Interesting. So four themes obviously confirmed. Um, that'll be interesting. Wonder which one it will be. Hmm. Regarding the new trial, Yoshi P says, he confirms it's part of the MSQ this time, helped by the fact that Savage is releasing one week later this time. He says it will not be revealed until the day of the patch who the trial will be against, and whether it will be part of a series. He says the trial is a bit more difficult than usual, even on normal. End quote. So interesting. Um whether it'll be part of a series. Now, typically we've had like a series of, of trials that are introduced later into an expansion. We're at that point already, uh, the same point where in Shadowbringers we were introduced to the weapon series, the Shadows of uh, Whirlit or Whirlite. So it'll be interesting to see what we've got. Um, I'm hoping that they're gonna go with the four fiends as trials, um, but we'll see. 
the second part of Pandemonium will dive further into the ancient way of thinking. One question to watch out for is, quote, what are we trying to seal in the depths of Pandemonium, end quote? Very interesting then. So what exactly is inside Pandemonium? Is there some kind of doomsday creature device, um, and another innovation or experiment? Very exciting stuff. I'm sure that will probably be the last boss, and um, I can't wait to see what that is. Uh, it will probably be alluded to in this tier, won't it? The second Savage tier will be harder than the first, Yoshi P says. The designers are aware that people are familiar with their level 90 rotations by now and have made adjustments based on this. At the time of the interview, Yoshida has only playtested the normal difficulty, but like the new trial, he believes it is relatively challenging. Interesting. Very cool. Very cool. So, yeah, this is typical. They try to say that they've made it harder than the first uh it's kind of it's kind of depends on who you are and what kind of fight is harder for you um i mean it, it really depends what you find hard already with the first tier i guess uh, they say based on feedback from the first tier that some fights a uh, i.e phoenix were hard to see They've paid more attention to the visuals and visibility this time, thank goodness. He also implies that the new tier will be flashier, oh no, since some felt that the last one was a bit plain compared to Eden, end quote. I don't know if I'm one of those people, personally. I think that it was plenty flashy. Um, I'm glad that they're toning down um, the, the lack of visibility, though, because Phoenix was very difficult. I think most people will agree. Red on red on red on red with orange was not exactly the best choice uh, for a fight you were grinding against to try and learn. So, um, yeah, I'm looking forward to more muted colors. Even if they want to make it explosive, just have nice muted you know, palettes so, so that we can actually enjoy the fight as well without needing sunglasses, that would be great. For Sephiroth Unreal, he says, the middle phase will be a weak point for many groups. If you don't pay attention to the order of buffs, heals, and then damaging the enemy, the tank can melt at an incredible rate. Yes, so the new Unreal Sephiroth. Um, this was said to be nerfed in some places, though, especially with Earthshakers and things like that. Uh, this was previously talked about in other interviews and live letters. Um, yeah, I'm still excited to see how challenging this will be. Uh, the likelihood is, though, that any mount that comes from it will be tradable, so I'll probably buy it that way. But uh, I'll give it a good go, for sure. Regarding the plan changes to Dragoon and Astrologian, the changes shouldn't be simply compared to Summoner. Instead, he mentions Ninja. The changes to that job during 5.x were considered a major overhaul by the devs, through the playfield, uh, though the playfield was still similar. Regarding Dragoon, the discussions have been about reducing the number of actions that need to be used by merging actions. Though he says he would like to avoid changing what Dragoon has to do as much as possible. For Astrologian, the changes are related to the cards. It's difficult to decide on adjustments to the cards since there are voices for and against the RNG element to them. Interesting takes from that then. So consolidating buttons into uh, smaller amounts of buttons. This is something we saw, uh, whether you love it or hate it, with Gunbreaker and uh, a few other jobs. Um, it's more akin to the consolidation and homogenization, if that's the right word to use, that they utilize for PvP, where you've essentially got eight buttons. Uh, it definitely seems to be the route that we're going in PvE as well. This might be the first precursor to that. Um, it'll be interesting to see what else they do with Dragoon, but they want to maintain what the job does at the same time as uh, reducing the button bloat. It could be a good thing. It's going to be speculative, really, as to what they're going to do. I can't really judge it until we see that. But um, yes, very excited to see. I quite like Dragoon currently. And as for Astrologian, I think a lot of people... Kind of find the RNG element fun, but also unreliable. So it'll be interesting to see uh, which direction they intend to go. If they'd like that to be, you know, just another cookie cutter type approach, or if they would like to still have that random element 
um, which can obviously be at the detriment to your party as well sometimes, which is interesting. We'll, we'll see what happens. The changes to direct hit and critical hits will be explained at length in the 6.2 Part 2 Live Letter. Again, I'm not sure they need to spend that much time talking about that, but fair enough. I suppose there are people who are still confused. On the new variant dungeons, most dungeons in Final Fantasy XIV are designed to be linear. Since it's a multiplayer game, veteran players will eventually decide on the most optimal route through a non-linear dungeon, which could also cause friction with new players. There will be ways of changing things on the route through the variant dungeons, such as pressing a switch to change the next boss's mechanics, but it might not always be a good idea to press the switch. By playing multiple times, you collect information on the lore of the dungeon, and this can include hints to hidden routes. There are two bosses per route. Oh, interesting. There will be unique variant actions in the dungeons, ooh, such as recovering HP or increasing defenses. This can help to make up for a missing role, since the normal difficulty version can have any party composition. So let's just quickly talk about that. So variant dungeons are the easier side of things, and they confirm to have two bosses, and they have ways of changing the bosses by clicking a switch or interacting with something. Um, very interesting. Two bosses per route. So you might not see all bosses per clear then, potentially. It might be different bosses. That's interesting. And the variant actions, that kind of reminds me of Logos actions, especially when they're explaining how you can you know, fill in for a role that's not there since you can queue without a roll, so presumably there'll be like a tank stance type ability to give you increased resistances and things. Very interesting. It's very, very interesting. It's interesting to me from, you know, loving Eureka and Blue Mage and that kind of thing to see how much further they're reinventing that and reusing a lot of those ideas to make these sorts of con uh, pieces of content work. Very cool. They say for the higher difficulty, which are known as the Criterion Dungeons, basically the same idea but higher, via Party Finder you can enter with any composition, but Duty Finder will match you with one tank, one healer, one melee, and one physical or magical ranged. The difficulty level is too high for the Savage version, so there won't be matching for that. Interesting. So for the higher difficulty stuff, um, you basically have that set up and you won't be able to use Party Finder for the Savage version. Obviously, that will be a pre-made group, probably with your friends or members of your static. So they're really going that four player Savage route. I'm very excited to see what that's like. I've wanted four player Savage stuff ever since we saw the four player extremes with Raffalos. So very excited for that. Let's move on to more juicy Topics such as Island Sanctuary then. Awesome stuff. Island Sanctuary doesn't have a storyline attached to it, Yoshi P says, other than some simple quests leading the player to the island. The weather will change on the island, but it will not snow since it is located in an area of the world where it doesn't snow. Interesting. So with weather changes, does that also mean that we have certain crops based on the weather. Interesting stuff. Mostly Island Sanctuary will not connect to the rest of the game's systems. For example, being able to get tokens to exchange for items outside the island. But when you explore to the limit, he says, you will find some elements that connect to the outside world. Very interesting. So that's that's very cryptic. So what kind of things? Interesting. He implies some elements of the island's development will be on a weekly timer, namely cultivating crops. Oh, interesting. So we're going to have like weekly, you know, it's going to take a while for those to grow. Presumably we need to like log in to, to water those crops or something. Interesting stuff. Depending on the weather, I guess, if it's too hot. There's a lot of speculation you could have from that, isn't there? Very exciting. Very exciting. I think this may have already been confirmed in the last live letter, he says, but for further confirmation, housing items cannot be used on the island. We kind of knew that. The island is not intended as a replacement for housing. Instead, it's about developing an uninhabited island, end quote. So, you know, this was never going to be a replacement for housing. It's not intended to be a replacement. However, if you don't have a house, this is going to be the closest thing you have to it, right? Apart from maybe an apartment if you have one. 
But, um, you know, the way I see this is probably like a, a series of choices of where you place certain buildings. There probably will be some kind of like barn or something like that, right? And there'll probably be drop downs or, or things you can select from, you know, a, a list of things you can choose from. So perhaps there will be limited customization, but there'll still be probably quite a bit of customization, I'm, I'm guessing, right? So, um, yeah, it's not a replacement, but it's certainly something that could bridge the gap for people who feel like they don't have a slice of the game for themselves. I guess you could kind of call that housing without it being actual housing. Um, there will be rewards such as mounts for making progress with developing the island. The interviewer asks if mounts can also free roam on the island. Yoshida says first of all he wants people to enjoy the free roaming minions, but doesn't rule out the possibility of mounts. So as we said before in, in our speculations talking about this, uh, obviously there'll be all kinds of cosmetic rewards, right? They want to make this an optional piece of content, so it's very likely you'll see minions as rewards, achievements, titles, and now we have confirmation that there will be mounts. So whether that'll be through a breeding system, if you want to speculate about that, or perhaps just, you know, the discovery of some kind of mount or something. I have no idea how that will work, but it would be nice to think about the idea of breeding animals and, you know, creating a horse mount, for example, or something. Who knows? So let's talk about the... Um, also, oh, we can queue up on the duty finder whilst on the island. The interviewer jokes that this gives people another excuse never to leave. I completely agree. I completely agree. I never want to go to Limsa again whilst queuing. On the relic weapon then, oh interesting, for the past two expansions, these have been tied to the large scale content of Bojia and Eureka, but this has both its good and bad sides. This time, since the team are working on a lot of other content for the expansion, it was decided to return to the Realm Reborn and Heavensward model of relic weapons. In discussions with both the scenario and battle team, it was decided it would be a lot of fun to make the Mandeville weapons related to Hildy. Look forward to what happens when Godbert and Geralt stand side by side. There will be a simple progression to the 6.25 quest, and he hopes people can play it casually, like with anima weapons. Yes, uh, casually, where we go and try to get all of them. Yes, that's... <laughs> Oh <laughs> uh, dear, they sorely underestimates the casual nature of collectors. <laughs> I intend to try and get every single one of them. Uh, let's hope I can actually do that. It's it's exciting though, but it does make sense. Somebody asked me the other day uh, if you if I think personally there'll be a six point three um, ultimate. And I said, absolutely. Uh, one of the key elements of that is the fact that they're returning to a relic that's outside of Bozja and Zadnor and Eureka. Now, if you remember, Osmasan is in charge of a lot of the work uh, or has been in, in, you know, involved with Ultimates before as well as that kind of content. So the more people that they're focusing on the battle content, such as Ultimates and things like that, the more those will be on time. And uh, as a result of that, obviously, uh, sadly, or well, depending on how you view it, we won't have that kind of Eureka-style content this time. That doesn't mean that it won't be in this expansion. They haven't outlawed it completely, but it's less likely considering they're going this direction with the relics, which is fine. Um, hopefully they'll have lots of relevant things that you can do, lots of choices. That's the thing with relic weapons. The, the best thing is variety, right? It's a slice of life. It keeps people interested. Uh, the worst things are where you have to do a specific thing locked in a specific thing repeatedly. Um, so hopefully there's lots of options. We'll have to wait and see, but that's exciting for me. I, I do like my relics. Um, then they talk about Crystalline Conflict. The de developers plan to improve the season ranking rewards since there was feedback that these have been underwhelming. There are also plans for an official tournament. The developers are currently fairly pleased with the job balance based on Season 2 data, end quote. So, interestingly enough, I... I disagree and agree uh, they are underwhelming uh, a lot of people don't like the fact that the frames are same uh, basically the exact same frames from season one 
uh, but they have the Roman numerals 2 on them instead of 1, uh, indicating that they're from Season 2. There are good bits to that and bad bits, so if you miss the first ones, you can still get something that looks the same. But also, I kind of wanted them to do something different. Uh, a lot of people are waiting for the next um, season, uh, the, sorry, the series rewards um, in 6.2, and then they'll probably do ranked as a result of that to get those at the same time as their fancy frames that's what kind of happened in season one of the ranked pvp so in season two there's not really much for people to do i got to gold the other day and uh, it was a very very hard thing to do simply because there was nobody queuing for it it was very tricky so i agree but i also personally would not like a return of those exclusive mounts that we saw in previous um, Feast seasons. I don't really like that. I prefer the good stuff to be in the series and there's to be little things in terms of, um, you know, like frames and things like that. I don't know what they could do, but I don't know, adventurer plate stuff, some other things, I don't know, new poses, something. But I don't want to see personally a return to mounts that are locked behind 100 people only. I think that's a little bit sad. But there we go. That's my personal opinions. But um, we'll have to wait and see what they do. Hopefully they don't go back on those decisions um, personally. At the end of the interview, he mentions new UI features coming in 6.2. Interesting. And that's pretty much all they inferred in this particular translation. He does admit there's a bit more detail in the interviews on some sort since I'm short on time this morning. Cool. Um, so obviously the link to the actual interview is on here as well. You can just click the hyperlink and it takes us over to the Famitsu website. Of course, we can translate that into English using Google. It's not going to be very good, but we can definitely give it a go. Um, but yeah, if you want to check this out yourself, definitely do so. But thank you, Killaby. Um, I will certainly be linking that in the description of the video. Things to take from this then. <sighs> the Highland Island Sanctuary was never intended to be housing or a replacement for it. But that's not going to uh, be what the community you know, decides. You might have the designs of it not being that, but the community will certainly make it that, <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, they will try to to en engross themselves in this as much as possible, even if there's only a few drop-downs and selections. It could honestly be the option they're looking for to, uh, to stem the tide of people's complaints about the housing system and the, the bad luck that people face with the lottery system. So, it'll be interesting to see people's reactions to the island sanctuary i'm personally all in i'm looking for forward to it 100 percent. i can't wait to see what things i can unlock and addictive nature of things the weekly timers have got me a little bit um concerned hopefully there's not like dailies that i need to do every single day i mean I'll, i will do them but i don't want to be like slogged into that content i know it's going to be optional i don't want to necessarily be gravitated to it every single day um you know to get the most out of it it'd be nice if i could just vocationally do that rather than having set timers and you've got to log in or you'll miss this opportunity um, as a content creator that's going to be more prevalent than many i would imagine but yes lots to take in this was a really good interview and it's probably the first one we've had in a very long time um what do you think about this are you happy with island sanctuary from what it sounds like, are you still going to make it your little home regardless of what Yoshi P says? <laughs> I know many of you will. Let me know what you think, and uh, I will definitely see you all next time. Have a good day. Bye-bye. <laughs>